Kate, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So Kate, your talk at PitCon 2015 is about separations research carried out at NIST. Why do you do separations research at NIST? So in our group, we do a lot of work where we make uh, what are known as standard reference materials. And these are matrix-based materials. So they're very complex samples. We look at analytes in foods. We look at environmental samples, clinical samples. And in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to separate the analytes from the matrix and from one another. In addition to that, we have to perform two methods for every measurement that we make and we try to make those methods as orthogonal or as different as possible so that we can investigate any sources of measurement bias that we have. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to find different ways to separate and measure the different compounds and having a good fundamental understanding of how to separate the different analytes um, allows us to make better choices in our method development process. And you and colleagues at NIST have studied the correlation of molecular properties of the stationary phase, specifically shape selectivity, with chromatographic behavior. First, why did you, un why did you decide to undertake that work? Right. So a lot of the work began long before I got there. Uh, Lane Sander and Steve Wise were running um, a priority pollutant test mix that was polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And they noticed that they got very different separations on columns that were nominally the same. So they were all C18 columns, but some of them resolved all of the analytes and others didn't. Because of that, they went into an investigation of what factors in a stationary phase allowed the separation of the analytes mm -hmm. of interest. So how do you carry out those studies on shape selectivity? We are really fortunate at NIST in that we have the capabilities or the facilities where we can make stationary phases, um, we can pack columns, we can do the chromatographic work, and then we have a number of collaborators where we do spectroscopic work. So we perform these by making very systematic series of stationary phases where we'll change the ligand length carbon by carbon or the density of the ligands on the surface of the silica. Um, and by changing each bit, uh, we can study which parts have an effect on the selectivity. Um, then we do the chromatographic studies to confirm that we're actually getting the separations that we expect to go back and double test and make sure our theories are correct. Uh, and we, as I said, have lots of collaborations where we do spectroscopic studies looking at the ligands on the surface to see how they're interacting, how they're ordering together. So you mentioned studying different ligands, for example. So what are some of those examples of the things you've studied and, and some examples of results you've had? Okay, so the, the initial studies that we did, um, and especially Lane and Steve did initially, were on C18 stationary phases. Um, since then, my own postdoc work, we looked at the effects if there were differences, if you had odd length, um, hydrocarbon ligands versus even length hydrocarbon ligands. Uh, we've looked at extending the lengths of those, especially um, longer stationary phases uh, make better separations, um, more highly shape selective separations uh, for longer analytes like carotenoids. Um, mm -hmm. So we've investigated those a little bit differently. Fascinating. So then, how does this knowledge you've gained about shape selectivity, how is that used to design new stationary phases? Like, do column manufacturers make use of your research? So what we've learned in all of this is we've learned that by increasing the ordering of the ligands, so making them almost straight up and down, we get better shape selectivity. Uh, we've taken that then and applied it to other types of materials. So one of the things that we began to think about was adding perfluorinated ligands instead of hydrocarbon ligands mm -hmm. because the fluorines hold the carbon backbone out a little bit more extended. Um, mm -hmm. They make it more ordered. Um, 
and we found that that works beautifully for at least some shape selective applications. We're trying to move out from the original PAH work because lots of other molecules have uh, different molecular shapes but very similar other properties, you know, so we want to be able to move out into larger molecules, um, biopolymers especially. Um, we have worked with a number of column manufacturers. We've had a number, number of column manufacturers ask and come in, and we've shown them how we synthesize phases. Uh, we're always interested in doing that because while we make these phases for our own investigations, they're really not made to be scaled up the way we do it, the way you would scale it up for production. Um, and the column companies are really much better at doing that. When we're actually using stationary phases for our own measurements, even if it's something that we've designed, uh, we end up purchasing the columns from column manufacturers because they are so reproducible batch to batch and we don't have quite that skill level. Yeah, that's what they specialize in, right? right? Right. So in general, are they very open to learning about what you're doing and intrigued? And uh, some companies aren't. It depends on uh, what types of separations people are most interested in at the time and whether or not they see a niche mm -hmm. for that type of stationary phase because it's a lot of expense and effort for them to um, take the prototype for a phase essentially and develop it into a commercial product. So I'm guessing they're more likely to do it if it's something that they don't feel they already have or have some networks exactly. as well for. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You recently published a paper on the use of 2DLC for the quantitation of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Why did you want to use 2DLC for quantitation, given that it's mostly been used for qualitative studies? Right. 2DLC is wonderful for qualitative studies. Uh, but at NIST, again, we're all about being able to perform the measurements. So we really want to be able to do the better separations to take advantage of that enhanced peak capacity that you get in a two-dimensional separation and to use that for making measurements. Uh, the only thing was we weren't sure that it was going to work quite as well for quantitative measurements as it is for qualitative determinations of peaks. So in your study using 2DLC to analyze polycyc polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, you focus on gaining a better understanding of the impact of different peak integration approaches on the quantitative capabilities of 2DLC. So what did you find there? We did. So first, uh, we made a rather contrived separation system where we know how those polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons separate so well that we set up a system where we can separate all of them in one dimension and make a measurement of it, but we can also force some of them to co in one dimension and then separate in a second dimension. So we could compare the 1D quantitation that we had with the 2D separation quantitation that we had. Um, then we took all of those data, which ended up being fairly significant amounts of data, and putting it into um, all of the different commercial 2D software that we could find available at the time. Also, um, our postdoc at the time, he's now a staff scientist, Ben Place, uh, programmed, developed an R program um, where R is the program itself uh, for doing the quantitation. What we found is that to some extent all of the programs worked quite well at performing the quantitative aspects. Uh, there was more uncertainty in some of the programs than others. Uh, some of them had more flexibility in how you could actually integrate the peaks, whether you would do um, valley to valley, whether you could do baseline dropping, and that made a real difference in the comparison of the results to the 1D separation. Um, but overall, they all worked. The biggest difference was the amount of time that each type of quantitation took. Oh, how big were the differences? Uh, 
I went through and hand integrated a series, <laughs> and that took about 15 minutes a chromatogram to go through and hand integrate each one of the little slices. Uh, Ben's program with R took about 15 seconds. Um, Melissa Phillips and Mallory Morris were the ones who investigated some of the commercial software. And those, when you included importing the data into the programs, could take, mm, one to five minutes mm -hmm. to integrate each chromatogram. So it was quite a range. And overall, how well did the 2DLC do for quantitating the PAHs? It did really well in this contrived system. <laughs> we have to admit that once we move to something more complex, we're not entirely sure. Uh, but in first principles, it looks like um, all of the sample was transferred from one dimension to another, uh, and there was a fair amount of flexibility in the data that we could look at, um, as, and the quantitative results compared quite well with the one-dimensional separations. Are you going to pursue next steps in that work? We will pursue next steps in it because it does um, provide us that peak capacity um, advantage. Uh, we are applying it right now um, to a series of biopolymers that are found in berries. So we're doing a one-dimensional separation. One dimension uh, separates the molecular weight groups of the different polymers and then we have a reverse phase separation that um, separates the heterogeneous nature of the different polymers in each molecular weight group. So are those polymers that have some special nutritional value or something like that? They are definitely claimed with having nutritional value, right. uh, especially in cranberries, but they're also found in wines, they're found in cinnamon, so people are quite interested in being able to compare how their foods are different um, mm -hmm. from other foods. Yeah, right, so you need good methods to be able to analyze that. Right, and right, compounds. right, and we're using it for both qualitative and quantitative mm -hmm. purposes in that case. In some of this work, how did you work on the shape selectivity studies? Did that come into play in some of that? It does come into play. Um, it definitely came into play in, the in that first quantitative project mm -hmm. uh, because we could take advantage of really knowing how to tune the selectivity to push peaks together and bring peaks apart in the different dimensions. But then with the biopolymers, we're also using it because um, some of them have two bonds, some of them only have one bond. They have different flexibility and rigidity and shape to them. So being able to know more about the shape selectivity allows us to do better separations. Okay, thanks so much for talking to us today.